there's a common starting point of analysis, if you will, in business strategies called a SWOT tool, mm -hmm. strength, weakness, opportunity, threat. And yep. you typically build a rectangle and divide it into four rectangles and each word goes into rectangle. And you try to, to do an honest introspection of where your company or your business is in the marketplace. Well, you know, what are your business strengths? What are your business weaknesses? What opportunities for growth do you think are out there in the coming year or five years, depending on your time frame you're looking at? And where, where are the threats? Mm -hmm. Customers, suppliers, competitors, uh, new entrants, you know, there's all different sets of categories where those threats can come by. If you take the last two opportunities and threats and change that to love and fear, mm -hmm for an individual and a life strategy where your opportunities in life are is where your loves and your passions are. Sure. If you, if you know them, if you don't know them, let's go out, go out and try some things and see if you might have a love for something Yeah. Uh, in your life. And then your threats is where your fears are. What's, you know, threats are disruptions to your business. So fears are where disruptions are going to occur in your life. Um, uh, uh, keep you in your comfort zone, not taking risks in life, not taking risks in relationships mm -hmm. or uh, or the way that you approach relationships. And let's look at those things as opportunities to A, identify and B, learn something about yourself and C, work on those uh, so that they either disappear or they turn into an opportunity. Oh, depending on what day of the week it was, my dad was uh, in corporate sales, so he was often uh, on the road. Mm -hmm. So if it was just my brother and I, my mom, sometimes we'd just be uh, have a t what we called a TV tray full of food sitting in front of the television set. Yeah. Uh, but when dad was home, uh, it was the four of us. Uh, we usually waited for him to get home from the office, and mm -hmm. it was never an exact science because of traffic and so forth, but. Um, it was usually the four of us uh, sitting around and having a conversation about the day. Often my brother and I got asked what happened at school. I mean, it was your typical Americana, not anything out of the yeah. ordinary. What, what types of topics would you guys normally you know, talk about? Was it, I mean, you know, your, your dad was in corporate sales, so I don't know if mm -hmm. he would talk about that. And, you know, maybe that's where some of your entre uh, entrepreneurial um you know, foundations maybe started perhaps. I'm just, just curious if there's anything that you can sort of track uh, back that says, you know, this is maybe where I got it from. No, lots of conversation about business with my dad, but usually not around the dinner table. Dinner table is usually about our, about our day and what was going on in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I share the desire that my dad had that, um, you know, I've already lived work. I don't want to relive it again uh, when I get home. Yeah kind of thing. I'm more interested about what everybody else did as opposed to, to what I did. And, you know, a lot of it's dealing with negotiations or price conversations or whatever. It's just not real yeah. interesting stuff to, uh, to the family. So uh, a lot of the conversation was on uh, Saturdays or the weekends about business or out at the mm -hmm. ballpark. You know, my dad is, uh, in the Illinois Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, wow. Uh, so baseball cool. uh, was a big sport for him and for the family. And so he taught me everything he knew about baseball when I was growing up, uh, which I played through high school. And so mm -hmm. often out the ball field with him, throwing the baseball around, whatever, we'd have business conversations then. And the best piece of advice he, he ever gave me was the day that um, – that sheet of paper that says I have a degree from Georgia tech was put in my hand. And uh, I think he's still confused as to why he has a son who's an engineer um, because math skills are not his, his best thing, nor his computers. Um, but he said, Andy, I just want you to remember that just because you can build something as an engineer, doesn't mean you can sell it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that always stuck with me throughout my entire life and entire career that um, you really need, you need to have a market need. You got to have something that's driving the need for that product or service that you're, that you're trying to offer to the mm -hmm. world. And so 
you almost have to reverse engineer it, right? Where's the problem? And then re reverse engineer the solution backwards um, before you bring it to market. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it served me well as an entrepreneur. Did, did he, I, I mean, obviously he was in the corporate world trying to sell something. So he had that, you know, that kind of perspective. Um, did he offer you any type of advice on, you know, like, like you said, you know, reverse engineer it. That's sort of what mm. you've learned, you know, now, but did he give you any you know, initial steps that, you know, you should be looking for this, this, and this to be able to, um, you know, make sure that you can sell this thing or, or, um, you know, I guess just the viability of a particular product. Is he, did he give you any type of advice along those lines? Does that make sense? Yeah. So well, lots of conversation about the different types of products and services. So obviously you want to be uh, as unique as possible and fulfilling the niche mm -hmm. so that your competition is small. He, he was, um, he worked for international paper for over 20 years and he worked in uh, what's called the corrugated box mm -hmm. division. Everybody else calls it a cardboard box, but mm -hmm. um, he probably shoot me to hear me say and call it a cardboard <laughs> box. But it was, for the most part, uh, close to a commodity product. And so pr pricing, 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 and expense, expense, expense drove his business. Yeah. And so it was lots of conversation around that. But um I always advise people who are trying to become entrepreneurs is try and get as unique as you can because you'll have the better position within the marketplace and mm -hmm. can compete on speed or, or the product itself or and uh, garner as much value as you can out of the marketplace. Whereas if you're in a commodity product, it's all about what surrounds the product, yeah. that, the marketing, the service. Um, you know, came out of the aviation industry. So the airlines are all about the service level, mm -hmm. you know, because getting somebody from point A to point B, everybody's using the same airplane that you are yep. using yep. the same parts and so forth. So it's a commodity from that perspective. It's all about the experience the customer has with your, with your airlines can be the differentiating factor. Yep. Talk a little bit about, about your background. Cause you've got a couple of different degrees. Like you mentioned before, you know, you've got engineering, you've got computer, uh, uh -huh. you know, so, so talk about some of those initial jobs that you did or, or initial, um, positions that you held, uh, and, and what you sort of learned from that, 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 you know, propelled you to, to start going and, and offering your own, um, your own services. Uh, so I went to Georgia Tech, got an electrical engineering degree. Most of my coursework was in computer chip design. Uh, I wanted to come out as a sales engineer, sort of a combination of my dad and myself from that perspective. But at the time when I came out of Georgia Tech, they were only hiring PhDs uh, in the area of computer chip. They were actually doing the design work. There wasn't much demand for sales engineers. So I decided to turn around and go get a master's at Georgia State in computer information systems, which is uh, you know, sort of um, the learning grounds for becoming a CIO. How do you, how do you leverage strategy and technology together um, in the strategy of the business and what you're trying to go after in the marketplace? And it came out of that and uh, got hired on with a small 50 person entrepreneurial firm that was using a brand new desktop technology called Geographical Information Systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were pretty leading edge from that perspective, took on a client in the aviation world and they hired me away from that company. And so now I'm even a smaller company, about 17 people becoming oh, wow. the main IT, main IT person, um, automated a, a ton of their processes and reduced their expenses by 75% uh, from that process. And then the two owners decided they were going to sell the business um, and sold it to a company that eventually got acquired by Boeing Okay. Um, in the aviation world. And when it, Boeing bought us, they wanted to get into the airspace design business in an effort to help governments bring GPS uh, into flight and ground operations. So the equipment was already on the airplanes and the air, uh, airlines were chopping at the bit to use it, but there was no structure, if you will, uh, up in the air for it to be used. And so mm -hmm. they asked me to start a consulting service from scratch to assist governments in bringing GPS into 
the flight and ground operations, the, uh, the most um, visible projects we worked on is we helped put the Chinese and Russian governments get their airports ready for the 2008-2014 Olympic Games. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the, the Beijing work we did enabled them to become the second busiest airport behind um, the airport here in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, yeah. yeah. Uh, from that perspective. Um, the unique service, a whole different animal when it comes to governments versus, uh, you know, the public or the, the private sector, so to speak, sure. that, we, that most of us live in, um, where you're having to answer contracts and compete head on with other companies for the services. There's, you, you want to create relationships, but really the relationships is just to make sure you get that announcement for uh, the proposal request that's coming out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of governments want to make sure they're getting the best value for the service that uh, the private sector has to offer, which is a combination of the, you know great value and the service, but at the lowest price possible. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, so a whole different animal. So, so I, I obviously, you know, you, you've have an engineering mind and I, it feels like you applied that throughout your, um, your employed history, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it that you saw that, that you said that I, I, you know, want to start, you know, doing this on my own? What, what, what was it that was that, that motivation to be able to start pushing you toward doing your own or creating your own company? Uh, well, a combination of my own skills and talents that I naturally have, as well as those that I developed in a true passion and why in life and wanting to help um, people find their passion and why in life. And mm-hmm. maybe you can turn around and turn that around into a um, strong and big and successful business for them for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I would say that's 50% of it. The other 50% of it is just seeing the bureaucracy and the mistakes being made from a leadership perspective within um, the corporate business world uh, that drove me crazy and kept me up in the middle of the night and so forth that I wanted to try and help build a cadre of young leadership talent that Mm -hmm. uh, could learn from those experiences and so forth and try and make the, you know, the corporate business world a, a better place. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes, that makes sense. And I, I completely agree. I've, uh, I I've had plenty of instances where, you know, we've been, you know, in the boardroom and, and see just, just the, the, the types of things, the types of, or the ways that people lead other people is, is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, you know, there's certainly better ways to be able to do it. So in, in your experience, what are some of those things that you've sort of adopted as being your, um, you know, kind of your benchmark that you, that you really excel at, you know, teaching people how to overcome or how to look at these things differently, or, um, you know, w- what are the, the strengths that you bring to other people to be able to, to, to bring them to a, a different place in their own lives? Yeah. And the, the biggest is the realization that it's an inside out, inside out effort mm-hmm. as leadership. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there in the world that feel like uh, if I can convince somebody to give me a title or responsibility and accountability, then I'm automatically a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to do what I say you need to do mm-hmm. kind of basis, as opposed to looking inside yourself and learning how to be a leader by uh, your, your work and your effort to lead yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in that effort of self-leadership, you, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fall down. You're going to pick yourself back up and learn from it and just make better and better and better decisions for yourself. And through learning that you're now more informed, you have experience and so forth to make decisions that are going to affect other people. Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm sure we've all seen the 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 pictures of, you know, the leader versus the boss, right? The leaders, you know, out front you know, first one charging the way the boss is on top of everybody with the whip. Right. So Mm -hmm. is that, is that basically what you're saying? You know, there's, there's, uh, you know, certain people that will, um, you know, sort of just dictate, 
you know, this is the way that you have to do it, or I expect Mm -hmm. this, or, you know, this is the way that it needs to be done. And then there's the other people that are saying, you know, let's, let's, let's figure this out together. Let's, you know, explore this. Let's, you know, what's not working about this for you. And, you know, let's, let's develop this together. Uh, Is that kind of what you're getting at, you know, from those two different types of leadership mindsets? Yeah. And there's, there's different ways you can slice it. It's, uh, is it, is it love versus fear? Is it power versus influence? Is it uh, words versus actions and, and modeling? I mean, there's a, there's a, it's like a diamond. There's a lot of different types of facets and uh, things that you can measure it, measure it by. And are, and are you paying attention to all those? Are you being introspective enough that you can, on your drive home after work or whatever, think about your day and how you did things and, mm-hmm. You know, are you going to have some moments like oh, I could have done that better? Yeah, you know, and, maybe and I should have done should have done it this way, and I'm going to try it that way next time and see if I get a better result out of it. Yeah, yeah. And and do you have any types of frameworks or anything like that that you use, or you know, or or some type of technique tip to be able to, um, you know, identify some of those those shortcomings, or is this just again something that's sort of uh, you know, you're just doing those, those self-reflections and, and, you know, maybe I should have done it better this way, or, you know, is, is, are, do you ever give yourself the ability to be able to say, yeah, I, I did that perfectly. I did that, you know, the right way, or is there always, uh, you know, an opportunity to be able to, to do it better or, or I guess, you know, differently, there's always a different way to be able to do it, but I, well, I guess yeah, it's, it, it's about mindset, right? It's about growth mindset and always being introspective and always evaluating yourself. Um, oftentimes when I'm working with a client, if we're, if we're looking on the inside part, if we start there before we even start talking about what do you do in front of your team, and mm-hmm. things like that, I'm, I'm looking for a lot about the roles that love and fear play in their life. Uh, I've, I've adapted some business strategy tools uh, and done slight adjustments to them for life strategy tools to make sure that you're heading down the right path from a life perspective, as well as that you're in the right business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not getting up out of bed every day and planting your feet on the floor and have a, have a passion and a joy for what you're doing with your business, then we might need to have a conversation. Yeah. And, um, and there's so many people that are, that are like that, you know, they, they, maybe they were chasing a paycheck at one point and, and, you know, now they're in a place where they're miserable. They hate getting up every day. And, you know, that's, that's not no life to live either because, you know, you can't, you can't uh, be happy. You can't instill happiness in anyone else if you're unhappy yourself. Right. You know, exactly. Exactly. You're going to start projecting that on other people. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And then nobody else wants to get up out of bed and put their feet on the floor and come to work with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so explain what do you mean, you know, where you start at with the, the relationship that your client has between love and fear. Like what, mm. what, what does that look like when you're having that conversation? What, what are the, you know, is there a, so, is there a... so I've adopted, uh, there's, there's a common starting point of analysis, if you will, in business strategies called a SWAT tool, mm-hmm. strength, weakness, opportunity, threat, and yep. you typically re- build a rectangle and divide it into four rectangles and each word goes into rectangle and you try to, to do an honest introspection of where your company or your business is in the marketplace. Well, you know, what are your business strengths? What are your business weaknesses? What opportunities for growth do you think are out there in the coming year or five years, depending on your time frame you're looking at and where, where are the threats, mm-hmm. customers, suppliers, competitors, uh, new entrants, you know, there's all different sets of categories where those threats can come by. If you take the last two opportunities and threats and change that to love and fear mm-hmm. for an individual and a life strategy, where your opportunities in life are is where your loves and your passions are. Sure. If you, if you know them, if you don't know them, let's go out, go out and try some things and see if you might have a love for something yeah. uh, in your life. And then your threats is where your fears are. What's, you know, threats are disruptions to your business. So fears are where disruptions are going to occur in your life. Um, 
keep you in your comfort zone, not taking risks in life, not taking risks in relationships mm-hmm. or, uh, or the way that you approach relationships. And let's look at those things as opportunities to a identify and B learn something about yourself and C work on those, uh, so that they either disappear or they turn into an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yep. That, you know, so that process reminds me very much so of, of something that I do when I interview people. Um, so I, I always like to ask, and, and what I'm saying, interview people like to, for, for employment, you know, with our, mm-hmm. with our company. Um, so I always will ask, you know, what, what types of things do you enjoy doing? Do you, you know, do you feel like you excel at doing typically when you, you enjoy doing something, you like doing something, you know, those are the things that you feel like you're, you're really good at, right? Um, those are the things again, that, that you would sort of jump toward. And then I ask them the second uh, part of that question, what types of things do you not enjoy doing? Or do you feel that you're not good at, um, to, to, you know, be able to, again, identify those types of things that again, they just, you know, have a, have a mental block. Like, you know, for me, it's like doing paperwork, processing paperwork. I hate doing all of that stuff. Right. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's like so boring to me. And, don't tell, and, don't talk to me about travel expense for Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, that's hated yeah, them. exactly. Hated yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so it, it's kind of that, that same type of mentality, you know, identifying, you know, where, where, you know, you may be weaker at, and, you know, those are the things that maybe you're a little bit more fearful of. And then the things that you enjoy doing that the things that you sort of jump at, you know, those are the types of things that, you know, you, you would put into your love category. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like public speaking, I have a fear of public speaking, but yet you want to be a leader. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to have a challenge there. Right. Right. Yeah. And challenge there. Do, and do, do you feel like people may, uh, 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 like to me, public speaking, you know, is you're in front of 2000 people, right. Mm-hmm. You know, rather than, you know, maybe you have a, a company of 50 or a hundred people. Do they, do you feel like, you know, those types of people would be uh, intimidated by getting up in front of their own employees, their own staff, their own, you know, their own um, company, or is it again, getting, going on TV that they may be a little bit more fearful of. I'm, I'm just curious if, if you've seen. It, it's, it, it's different. It's different for depending on who the person is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's some people that have problems uh, sitting in uh, a team meeting of eight people that they're at work every day and they do the work, their heads down in front of their computer and they do the work. But if you're in a, a brainstorming, session with the team and the leaders looking for ideas or bantering around ideas. Uh, and you might have some in your head, but you're afraid to speak out and be part of that yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's not to say you're not a good worker and you're not contributing to the, the, the main cause, if you will, of the team. It's just that your creativity is being stifled because you're not willing to share ideas because you think somebody might go, Oh, that's a stupid idea. Yeah. Yeah. Or, 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 or logically say, well, that's not possible. Yeah. Kind yep. of thing that you take it personally. Yeah. No, that makes, that makes sense. Um, what are some of the other, I, I, you know, I, I feel like all of this is sort of revolving around, you know, the, the person's mindset and all of that. So mm-hmm. what are some of the other, uh, I guess, blockers that you commonly run into, you know, when it comes from a mindset standpoint that, uh, you know, maybe someone's not in the right type of mindset for, you know, being in the position of a leader. Um, any, anything else come to mind there? Well, there's things like um, a mindset of, I have to be this, I'm the leader, therefore I have to be the smartest person in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, or the mindset that uh, I'm the sheriff, I have the badge, I have the responsibility and the title, so everything I say goes, mm-hmm. and you all just need to listen to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, those get into some fear components of, um, they can be self-esteem based or something of that nature where uh, you're leaning towards the side of more arrogance as a protection, like just mm-hmm. do as I say, because I don't want any feedback or, or a thought that I might be wrong or, or only partially right or something of that nature. And I have to live up to this standard as a leader. I have, I have this mindset that the leader has to have a certain standard in all mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. that you don't have 
strengths and weaknesses, everything needs to be a strength. And in order to control that in the standard, I'm now forcing things on people Mm -hmm. to make sure that that is realized. Mm -hmm. Um, And and it's also a realization or, or an unrealization that biggest thing you're to be judged on as a leader by your superiors above you is results. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to come in at the end of the year and go, okay, what percentage of the work was done by you? And what percentage of work was done by team member A, team member B? No, they're, they're, they're looking at the goals of the unit and did you meet the goals? Mm-hmm. And that's going to be 75% or 70% or some number above 50 of what you're going to be judged on. So, you know, why wouldn't you then want to leverage the strengths within the organization and what you may be strong in as a leader, uh, somebody else may not be and vice versa. What you have as a weakness, you might have a team member that's really strong in an area that you can uh, somewhat lean on or leverage yeah. in order to get the best results out of the whole team and therefore the best results in the eyes of your superiors. Mm-hmm. And and I can see this also. Do, do you ever do any type of group sessions where you sort of explore uh, people's strengths and weaknesses to be able to extract like, you know, Jim, he's great at, you know, math or whatever. And Susie's great at the, you know, the, the organization side of things, but neither one of them are good at the other thing. So, so basically identifying people's strengths and weaknesses and sort of tying them together to to say, you know, these are the types of things you should be mm-hmm. doing and maybe focusing in over here. Does that, is that part I, of? I, I've never, never done that in a group setting. I've done that with individuals. And then, you know, my three personalities and me, myself and I take all yeah. that information and try to, to work with uh, um, the team from that, from that respect, mm-hmm. you know, but if you, if you're not having, if you don't have enough observation powers and enough conversations with your team members individually, it's kind of difficult to need the right, the right data in hand to say, okay, uh, you know, my business within Boeing was very project based. So Mm -hmm. I had to do an analysis of, okay, what type of work is necessary on this project and who's my best people uh, with those skills and talents and are they available? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. The I might mix. have to pull somebody off another project for a couple of weeks to do something in this other project to, to, for their strengths and to leverage that and then put them back on the other project the rest of the time. So, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. If you could, you know, sort of point your finger at something that you're, you know, you're very proud of, you know, that you've, that you've helped someone change uh, about themselves. What, what types of, what did life, look like for that, that person, you know, before you were involved in them, what did life look like, or, you know, their, their, their mindset, their deliverable, their, you know, their outlook, what did that look like after they went through the the process? Yeah. So I had on my, on my technical team members, I had five levels um, of capabilities um, in terms of their skills, talents, and what type of projects they could do. You know, at the very top level, they would be a, um, a leader on a project. Mm-hmm. And I had one gentleman who came into the organization, uh, hired them strictly on, or mostly on attitude. Uh, he was a master sergeant in the army working with tank battalions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were an aviation-based business you know and as far as i remember tanks run on the ground and not up in the air yeah but he had this tremendous attitude and mindset of wanting to learn um whenever i asked him to do something um uh, as part of a team or individually whatever his immediate response was always too easy you know just like i got it you know just like a master sergeant would in the army it's like i got this Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. Mr. Captain or Major or Colonel, whatever. Yes, sir. I hear what you're saying, and uh, and I've got this. And nose to the grindstone, and he came in at the bottom level. And within about uh, I think six seven years, he was at the very top most. Um, and it was just a, a constant working with him, either myself or his direct supervisor. And between his mindset and attitude and the training 
uh, that cost a lot. You know, we, we dealt with very complex technical subjects. And so whenever we were training people, it took a good bit of time and a good bit of cost that we were investing in that person. So between our efforts to teach him and his mindset got him to the topmost topmost level. And that takes, you know, a leadership of caring and believing in your people and, you know, somewhat meeting them halfway. You, you, you come halfway with your attitude. We're going to come halfway with our training and where the two meet and stick, you know, you're going to work your way, work your way up the organization and enjoy the benefits from a salary perspective, from a, what type of projects you get to work on, travel around the world in and so forth. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I wish I had a thousand of them. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's interesting. It's so difficult to be able to find, you know, people that, that put that effort into, you know, excelling and and into bettering themselves. And it is special when you can, you can find those types Mm -hmm. of people. Um, Andrew, if people want to learn more about you, your, your services, what would be the best way to best way to reach out and get in touch? Uh, there's two ways, uh, either through my website at www.generateyourvalue.com. Uh, I also uh, co-host a podcast um, called Generate Your Value. We talk about life leadership and small business topics. Uh, we're in our second season. Um, or my email, Andy at generateyourvalue.com. Um, uh, I offer up a free consultative session for those that might be interested in my services. Just to talk mm-hmm. about your situation, try to offer you um, a little bit of value and see if we're a good fit um, for what you hope to achieve in my skills and talents. Yeah. And, and talk a little bit about who, who would benefit, you know, the best from, from your advice, what, like, who's your ideal customer, the, the people that you feel you would, uh, you know, interact best with to, and be able to have the most impact on. Well, I bring the most impact on the small business owners that um, that I can teach some skills and tools. You know, ideally, I want to put myself out of business. I want to teach you enough skills and tools that you can go on and be uh, very successful in life and in in business. So that's my my end game. Is uh, I, I I don't want to be in a situation where you feel like you got to hang on to me, so to speak, for 30, yeah. 40 years, and I'm not doing my job. Uh, from that perspective, but um, those that are about to start a small business or have been in small business in, uh, for a number of years, but want to take it to the next level, or they want to bring a new product and service on, they want to grow vertically, horizontally, and they like to have somebody in their corner from a leadership perspective and a business strategy perspective is where I can bring the most impact yeah. um, to a client. I also do some life coaching with people that aren't small business owners, but it's not my sweet spot. Yeah, no, makes sense. Andrew, this is fantastic. Uh, many thanks for the time and the, the advice and tips and uh, look forward to, to hearing some more success stories from you, uh, hearing how people have, uh, their, their lives have changed by interacting with you. So keep it up and uh, we look forward to, to seeing more from you. I appreciate the invite, Matt. Thanks very much. No problem.